doing on uh, the things that accompany salvation. You know, a lot of people think that once you're born again, you're guaranteed of a place in heaven. They, they really believe that. And they, they totally ignore all the scriptures that say that we have to live in obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, if we don't know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, we're going to have a real problem. So we've been looking at some things that accompany salvation. And uh, the thing that we're going to look at today is what should we be like as Christians? Uh, how, how do we rec reflect the image of Jesus Christ? Does the world see Jesus Christ in the church, in us? And we're going to look at some scriptures that, that emphasize um, the importance of that. Uh, the first week that we did this, the first episode was on humility. What does it mean to be a humble person? You know, have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and asked yourself, are you a humble person? And we looked at passages of scriptures, you know, that, that said that Jesus humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of a cross. And, um, and Paul says, let that same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ. Do we know how to humble ourselves to the point of dying to ourselves and living for Jesus Christ? Uh, last week we spoke about bringing every, every thought into captivity. You know, the mind. The mind is so very, very important. Uh, scriptures is be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do we take that seriously? Yes, I am talking to you. Do we really take that seriously? We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about where we spend eternity. There's only two places, heaven or hell. The choice is ours. Jesus Christ died for everybody. But unless we come to him in humility, acknowledge our sins and repent, we will not be born again. We will not receive the Holy Spirit. We will not become new creations. We will not be translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So the first act is to be humble. Accept that we have sinned. Repent. Be born again. Now that, I want to tell you, is the beginning of our faith. To get born again, as newborn babies, we're born into the kingdom of God. We are different. We've been taken out of the world and placed into the kingdom of God's dear son. That is the beginning of our faith. Now comes the fun. Once we're born again, we are to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. We are to learn to die to ourselves. 
we, we are supposed to, I'm going to share some scriptures with us, with, uh, well, with us, yeah, I'm sharing them with me too. Um, this passage, I've alluded to this a few times in the last few weeks, in Galatians chapter 5, 15, uh, 16 to 26. Paul says this, he says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, please note, he doesn't say, do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh and you will walk in the spirit. Walking in the spirit is a decision that we make. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not something that will, God will come upon us and make us walk in the spirit. No, he says, you walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So we need to know what it is to walk in the spirit. What does that mean? And he goes on and he says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. How many of you have experienced that? You know what you want to do and what you should do, but everything within you wants to go the other way. That's the flesh and the spirit lusting against one another. The carnal man, the old nature, because when we get born again, yes, we're new creation, but we're still in this body of sin, this body of death, and it is our biggest enemy. So we're battling with, with our flesh. The, the, the flesh says, no, go this way, have fun, enjoy yourself. And the Spirit of God says to your spirit that's now living within you, he says, no, 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 go this way. This is the way, walk in it. And so we've got to come to grips with this understanding that we are in a war. The, the, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God's dear son are at war with one another. The devil is trying to steal you from God and take you to a lost eternity. And God is trying to woo you to, to spend a, an eternity with him in heaven. So he goes on, he says, these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't think that's difficult. That's not deep theology, is it? That's very simple. It describes what are the lusts of the flesh, and then he goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Please, this is a very, very powerful passage of Scripture that's telling us what we should not do and what we should do. Now, if I was to ask you, each one of you, could you list the nine fruit of the Spirit? There are nine of them. Could we list them? Or, or do we have them at, our, at the forefront of our thinking? Love, joy, peace, hope, goodness, kind. Or, or, or the fruit of the Spirit. We should be aware every day Am I developing? Um, are the fruit of the Spirit growing within me? Because remember, this is the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit is trying to work this fruit in us so that we can be like Jesus. This is the goal of a Christian's life, is to become like Jesus in every way, to think like him, to act like him, to speak like Jesus. So I don't think this is difficult. Personally, a lot of people seem to think it's difficult. No, 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 this is very, very simple. These are the things that you need to avoid, and these are the things that you need to encourage yourself in and practice. And you will find that there is a tension that comes into your life. Because now, when, when you're born again, the fun begins. When you're born again, now you're a problem for the devil. And he's going to hit you. He's going to try to steal what God has sown within you. In 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 5 to 11, Peter says, for also, for this reason, giving all diligence, come on, there's that word, 
diligence. Think about it. what is diligence. I mean, make sure, be very careful. Make sure you do everything right. It's not a, this walk with Jesus Christ is not a careless walk. That passage in, in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 2, I think it's verses 2 and 3, it says, Therefore let us give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. You, I don't know of anybody that's actually made a decision and said, oh, okay, I've had enough of Jesus Christ. I've had enough of reading the Bible. Actually, I do know one person that woke up one morning and he, he threw his Bible off his bedside table. He said, that's it, enough of that. And he went back into the world. So, so we need to appreciate that diligence is the opposite to carelessness and inattention. We need to be very diligent and careful with our walk with Jesus Christ. He says, add to your faith virtue. What does virtue mean? What does virtue mean? Do, do, we, have, we might have a fair idea, but what does it actually mean? Add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. What sort of knowledge? Is he talking about worldly knowledge? Of course not. He's talking about knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know, the, Paul, Paul prayed many times, Lord, open the eyes of their understanding that they might come into a, a greater relational knowledge of you. It says, to knowledge, add self-control. Ooh. How many, can, can we say we've got good self-control? Or when something happens, do we respond, um, you know, out of impulse? Are we impulsive? To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. These are the things that should accompany our salvation. This is, should be us. People should look at us and say, wow, that person such a loving, kind, good person. They should, they should look at us and see Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. He didn't say you'll know them by their cleverness or their good looks or... You'll, know, you'll be known by your fruit. What are our fruits. And we need to understand this. We, we shouldn't just read that and say, oh, that's a nice verse and move on. Say, no, hang on a sec. This is God talking to me. This is God trying to encourage me to finish the race and get to heaven. And, and for anybody that thinks for one minute that being born again is salvation, think again. Read 1 Peter 1 verse 9, receiving at the end of your faith the salvation of of your soul. We receive it at the end of our race, not the beginning. Narrow is the path, difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So God has given to us the means by which we can get there. He's given to us Jesus Christ, who paid the price for our sins, gave us a new beginning. He's given us the Holy Spirit that comes within us to empower us, to help us to do what is right. And he's given us his word to direct us as a signpost. If we don't read his word, what we're doing, we're saying to God, God, uh, it's not that important to read your word. I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I tell you, folks, the word of God is our life source. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We, we should know these passages of scripture because they're the scriptures that encourage us to be like Jesus Christ. And he goes on. He says, for if these things are yours and abound, in other words, not just oh, a little bit of goodness here, a little bit of self-control there, you know. He said, no, let them abound in our lives. He said, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And he goes on in verse 10 and he said, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Don't you find that is encouraging? Yes, it's tough. Yeah, it, it takes time, effort and self-control discipline, 
takes a lot of those things, but he's listed for us some faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge. So, and he lists them. It's there for us to see. But it's not for us to just look at and say, oh yeah, this is what the Bible says. We have to be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Many people call themselves Christians today, deceiving themselves, thinking that they got born again, they're home and home. So it doesn't really matter what they do in this lifetime. And that's a, that's a real big lie of the devil. So be even more diligent to do these things. For if you do, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to share a few passages of scripture with you that confirm this as to how we should be. We, we need to realize that, there, that it's not just these two passages. It's not just... Uh, one here, one there. It's all over the New Testament as to how we should be in Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to give you a few of them, okay? So in 1 John 2, 3 to 6. Now by this we know that we know him. Think what, it's, think what I've just read there. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now we're not talking here about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about every command that Jesus gave. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, he said. My commandments. So he says, um, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So we, we've got to look at the life of Jesus Christ. What was he like? What did he do? You know the, the biggest thing that is lacking at the moment? The power. The power. Without, without the character... And the fruit and the attributes of virtue, of kindness, etc., there will be no power. If we can't be trusted with what, what is plain, he's not going to trust us with his power. I, I really believe God's spoken to me about this. I'd love to see the power of God. I hunger for the power of God to be displayed in the church. You know, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, When I come, you'll know not just the word, but the power. You know, they, they, their shadows could cross the sick and, and they'd get healed. There were all sorts of things happening because the early church lived in vibrancy, vitality, because they'd seen the risen Lord. They'd seen the signs, the wonders, the miracles. Now, we shouldn't serve Jesus Christ for that purpose. But if we want to demonstrate our relationship with Jesus Christ, we should, we should be presenting his character and his power. So we, we've got to bear this in mind. The church, the church around the world today is basically powerless. I remember David Wilkerson writing a book about powerless Christianity. It doesn't glorify God. Now, if we can't be demonstrating the power, we should believe for it. We should ask God, demonstrate his power through us. But first and foremost, what we can do is live like Jesus Christ in his character, in his nature, how he was. So we have to walk just as he walked. In Galatians 2, 20, these are verses that we all know, but do we ever stop and think about them? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Do we get that? We've, we've taken in the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ has entered us. We have entered him. A perfect description of baptism. I'm baptized into Jesus Christ. Him and me, me and him. Now I have to demonstrate that I'm in Christ. And as the scripture says, by this you will know, they will know that you are my disciples when you have love for one another. Love is the essence. To love one another. If we love someone, we're prepared to die for them. Or are we? Or are we? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life 
which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Are we prepared to give ourselves for others? Are we prepared to put others ahead of ourselves? Now, we, we could be sitting here saying, oh, yeah, yeah. But when, the, when, it come, when the rubber meets the road, is that true? Is it true? Because I think if we're sitting here right now saying, oh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm prepared to die for others and, you know, help other people. If you're saying that to yourself right now, I'll guarantee you in the next week you're going to be tested. You will be tested. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, oh do we reflect Jesus Christ? John 3, 30. He, this is John the Baptist. He, you know, John the Baptist was, got a lot of uh, recognition, etc., etc. But he said, no, no, he, Jesus must increase. I must decrease. The, the, the me, the me that is David Owen, has to die. Jesus Christ has to rise up and take my place. Positionally, he already is. Now, in characteristics and, um, you know, the, the things that we do, it's that we, we've still got a long way to go. Still got a long way to go. Ephesians chapter 4, 21 to 24. If indeed you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You know, our outward man is perishing, but our inward man is being renewed daily. You know, my, my, as, I, as I get older, my body is getting older, and it starts to break down, and, you know, it's, it'll happen to you. Don't worry, be patient, just wait. Um, your body starts to break down, it gets old, it gets, starts to get worn out. But the spirit, I, I feel in spirit, I feel younger than I've ever been. Because I feel closer to Jesus Christ than I've ever been. That's one thing I can say of this pandemic. Thank you, Lord, for this pandemic because it's really caused me to press into you and I got to know him a lot better. So always, you know, in all things, give thanks. In all things, find something good to, to recognize. So he says that you put off concerning your former conduct, just ratifying all the scriptures we've looked at. Get rid of the old man. Get, let the new man rise up within us. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. This passage in Romans chapter 13, 11 to 14 and do this knowing that the time is now, sorry, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Now, can you see what that's saying there? How can your salvation be nearer than when you first believed if you've already got it? It's, it's something, it's the goal when we die we, and we reach the end of our faith we receive the salvation of our souls. And so he says, now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. That's not difficult, is it? It's really not difficult to understand. Doing it is not so easy. The diet itself is not easy. It requires discipline. As we spoke last week, it requires bringing the thoughts into captivity, into obedience to Jesus Christ. We need to appreciate that, that God has given us his word to instruct us as to how we should think. You know, sometimes you, you don't have control over what comes into your mind. But you do have control with what you do with it. You can cast it down. You can replace it with a scripture verse or something of that nature. You know, God speaks to us through the scriptures. There's many a time, many a time, where God will speak to you. he just give you a scripture and you know exactly what he means by it. 
In Galatians chapter 3, 26 to 27, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, now please bear in mind, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Baptized into Christ is not water baptism. It's the born again experience. Him in me, me in him. It happens at regeneration when we receive the Holy Spirit. So if we're in Christ, we should put on Christ. You know, do we wake up in the morning and, and, and sort of, you know, think, put on Jesus Christ. I've got to let people see Jesus Christ in me. On the inside, yeah, you're thinking, oh, wish I didn't have to get out of bed and go to church this morning. On the inside, we might be saying, oh, but on the outside, we put on the new man. Said, yes, I want to go and praise in the midst of the congregation. And, and we have this battle with ourselves, the mind of Christ against the carnal mind. This is the war that we're in. And if we become careless and inattentive to our walk, if we're not diligent with it, I guarantee you, 100%, you will go this way. Hang on a sec. I'm not sure how that looks from your end. So the walk, the walk of sanctification is difficult. It's, it, we're going up a hill. You know, we're going up a hill. We got born again here. Now we have to go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. As we die to self, God lifts us to another level of faith. He lifts us to another level of glory. You know it and I know. We all have a different revelation of Jesus Christ. None of us are the same. We all have a different level of faith. But the, the most important thing is that we're all going like this. Because you cannot go like this. You're either going like this or you're going like this. You're either getting closer to him, going face to face, or you're backsliding. And there's only so far you can backslide before you fall off the edge. So do we not have the incentive to be careful and diligent and, and treat our walk with Jesus Christ very, very seriously? Treat reading the Bible very, very seriously? Because that's what transforms our minds. Be renewed in the, the spirit of your mind. In Colossians chapter 3, 8 to, to 17... Paul writes, but now you yourselves are to put off these. Please notice that, he says, but now you yourselves are to put off these. A lot of people are waiting for God to do everything. Oh, but God's sovereign. He will, he will make me into the person that he wants me to be. Not without your assistance, he won't. Otherwise, everybody would be born again. Everybody would be serving God. No, he's given us all authority. He's given to us the means, the equipment, everything he's given to us for, for godliness and living, living for him so that we can finish the race. He's given to us everything. The question is now, will we use it? That's our responsibility. God is not going to come and thrust the Bible in your face. You know, my mom, she used to say, oh, I always have my Bible on my bedside table. And I, I said to her, that's not going to help you sitting on the bedside table. And, and we need to realize that if, we, if we're not taking an interest in what God has said to us, we're not taking an interest in God. We might think we are, but we're not. So the word of God is so crucial to us growing in Jesus Christ. And he, he gives another, another list. These are passages that we should look at regularly. Say, well, is that me? Is this describing me? Or am I far from it? And he says, put off these, anger. Anybody here get angry? Wrath. Anybody look for vengeance on somebody that's done something really bad to you? Malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, always make note when it says therefore, it gives you some information, it says therefore, this is your responsibility. It says therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, 
put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these, put on, the, the, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Again, it's not deep theology. You know, we, we have theo theologians trying to tell us this. And I'm, I'm a theologian. I know, I know that. I'm a theologian. And I try to explain. But it, things like this, you don't need them explaining, do you? Be kind to one another. No, no, what's the theology behind that? What's... I remember, I remember somebody that would always rationalize the scripture. Sue, Sue would know who I'm talking about. But you'd say something to him about the scriptures. And um, he'd say, oh, but that, that doesn't mean that. It means this. And he'd have some deep and hidden meaning behind it. And I, 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 got, I was getting really fed up with this. And I said to him one day, I said, look, what do you think Jesus meant when he was hanging on the cross? And he said, I thirst. And he said, thinking he's thinking I don't know I don't know what it means I said he needed a drink it wasn't difficult sometimes we look for hidden meanings and hidden this and hidden that yes there are allegories there are parables there are proverbs etc that need to be expanded a little bit but this is not difficult stuff most of the Bible you know I've heard many times people say oh the Bible's too hard no it's not it's not too hard. It's hard to do, but the Bible is not difficult to understand. So, it said, let the peace of God rule in your heart. You know, when we do things God's way, there's that peace. Even in the midst of trials and testings, there's that peace. Let, every, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful in all things. Give thanks. Doesn't matter what's going on, in all things, give thanks. Uh, let the word of God be, uh, read that, teach one another. Okay, you get the idea. So, ju just those two passages that we looked at in Galatians and, and Peter, just to get to and cap capture, what's the word I'm looking for? Put it in a nutshell, okay? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such as there is no law. You better learn that. Know what it is and examine yourself. You know that passage in Second Chronicles where Paul said, examine yourself, test yourself, prove yourself. Do you not know yourself as to whether you're actually in the faith? He tells us to examine ourselves to see whether or not we're actually walking in the faith. Are we being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ? Are we, are we actually prepared to help our neighbor when we're in trouble ourselves? Because that's what Jesus would have done. You know, imagine him hanging on that cross, blood dripping from him, the crown of thorns in his head, the nails in his hands and feet. It, it makes me weep when I, when I think of I try to pitch him there and, and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Those words in the midst of his greatest trial, those words just imparted grace to the whole world. And we are to be like him. We, are, we, are, we should be in the midst of all of our troubles, all of our testings, be prepared to give thanks in all things. Give thanks. Demonstrate that Jesus Christ. And in Second uh, Peter again, giving all diligence at your faith virtue. So th these attributes and virtues are very important for us. In Colossians 3, 12, just summarizing those passages, put on tender mercies, kindness, meekness, humility. This is what we should be like as Christians. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Love is not an emotion. You know, we talk about love as if it was an emotion. Oh, I don't, don't love that 
You know, people get divorced because I don't love my spouse anymore. Love's got nothing to do with feelings. What they're actually saying is, my spouse doesn't arouse me anymore. It's a, it's a carnal love. When, when, uh, if we're, if we're going to operate in the love of Jesus Christ, we should be prepared to lay down our lives for one another. Give up something that we might have that the other one doesn't. You know, if your brother asks for a coat, give him also your overcoat. That's, that's what Jesus would have done. When somebody's sick amongst you, pray for them. You know, pray as if it was you that had the sickness and, and ask God to relieve them of that sickness. Pray for each other. This, I like this quote. I'm not sure who actually quoted it, but I got it from Motivational Life. Um, the strongest people make time to help others, even if they are struggling with their own problems. I, I really like that. that that's, a, that's, a, that's biblical. This one uh, by Danny Thomas, I don't know who he is, but I really like this. Success has nothing to do with what you gain in life or accomplish for yourself. It is what you do for others. This is the whole principle of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Is, is that us? Does that reflect our standards, our morals, our virtues? This quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Somewhere along the way we must learn that there is nothing greater than to do something for others. Isn't that wonderful? You know, for, I can imagine Jesus saying that, but for a man to say it is special. Special. Uh, this one by Jesse Jackson. Never look down on anybody unless you're helping them up. Passage of Scripture in Matthew 20, 26 to 28. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 10, 25 to 26. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. Who's our teacher? Who's our master? If we want to be like him, that's all you need in life. If you're going to strive for something, strive to be like Jesus Christ. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today and the church bears the brunt of most. We're, we're the bad guys. We're the, the bad guys. But Jesus said, don't worry about that. He said, the world, the world's not going to embrace us. Remember the war between the two kingdoms? The world will not embrace Christianity. We are the bad guys. Now, just a couple of closing scriptures. This one in Proverbs 11.25. I love this verse. It, it, had, it ministered to me a lot when I was a young Christian. It says, the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will himself also be watered. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. You know, the scripture says you are what you behold. How you see things will be what you're like. So we should change our, our thinking. We should change what we're looking at. We should change the way we see ourselves. We should exercise this mind that God has given to us and fix it on the things above. So the generous soul will be made rich. In other words, if you're generous with your soul, if you're prepared to give out of your own time, of your own sustenance and your own everything to help somebody else, you will be watered from above. Nobody can outgive God. When you do things God's way, he will bless you. That's not why we do it, but he will bless you. You cannot outgive him. In Luke 6, 37 to 38, Jesus said, judge not, this is the principle of sowing and reaping, judge not and you shall not be judged, condemn not and you shall not be condemned, forgive and you will be forgiven, 
Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be put into your bosom. How, how many of you would like that? You know, to get all this stuff, pressed down, shaken together. Whoa. Yeah, come on, be honest. Well, it tells you how to do it. Don't judge, don't condemn. Forgive, you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, this, this passage in Malachi, chapter 3, why are we going to Malachi? Because I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that Christians make today. Will a man rob God? Well, that's a bit silly, isn't it? And bear in mind, this is the last book of the Old Testament. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? You know, there's a little conversation going on between God and, and his people. And he says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. Please, this is significant. A lot of churches preach about tithing because they, they want your money. And a lot of Christians won't pay their tithing because of that very reason. But this is what Jesus said. I, to be honest, I'm not in the slightest bit interested in your money, okay? But I am interested. I don't want God to curse you because you're holding back on the tithe. This is important. This is part of our Christian nature. I, I personally believe that the tithes and giving of your substance to anybody, whether it be the church or somebody to help them, I think that is the greatest blessing. It's more blessed to give than to receive. God will not let you go without your rewards, even if it might take several years, maybe 10 years. It will come back to us in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, etc., etc. So he said, you're cursed if you don't pay your tithes. And people will argue, I'll, I'll deal with this just because people will argue this point. And say, oh, but that's Old Testament. No, that is pre-law. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and which was long before the law. So it was just incorporated into the law. Nothing changes. You know, I, I, I think about a lot of Christians' attitudes towards tithing. You know, we're prepared to pay 50 bucks to go and watch a football match or pay this for that, go, go somewhere and pay money. But when it comes to the things of God, we're reluctant to, to, to pay anything. And yet God looks down and he says, come on, this is tithes and offerings as part of your devotion to me. It's, to me. To me, it's the biggest test of our faith to take your hard-earned money and put 10% of it into the storehouse. That, that's a real test of faith. I remember, what, what was that guy's name, Sue Stanley, Stanley Tam? I don't know whether you've ever heard of him. He started off, he became a Christian. He, he, he had nothing. He started off as a Christian, and he gave what he could, like the widow's might. You know, he just gave what he could. And... Um, as he gave, he seemed to, doors opened up for him. And so he got to the point where he could pay 10%. He could pay the actual tithe. And then he found God took him into developing a business. And the business started to prosper. And as he prospered, he said, I'm, I'm going to give more. And he started to give 20%. Cut a long story short, he got to the point he was paying 90% of everything that he made to the church. And I, I don't like to say to the church because it's actually giving it to God. You're actually giving it to God. And uh, he got to the point where he, he couldn't outgive God. Could not outgive God. Now, we don't do it for that reason. We do it to be obedient. See, if we want to be obedient to Jesus Christ, we have to be obedient in all things. All things. So... That's just, a, and you know, I never preach on tithing because people, oh, he's only after your money. I'm not interested in your money. I'm interested in the blessings that come to you. You read that passage for yourself. And, and God says, try me now, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, 
for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord. Wouldn't you like people to, to look at you and observe you and, and say, wow, where did, how do they get so blessed? Well, it's all in the scripture. All these things are in the scripture as to how we should be. Jesus was prepared to give it all. He gave it all. And so, we, with all these passages of scripture, they're telling us about um, how we should be, what we should be doing. Do we take them seriously? Do we take them seriously? This, this quote, uh, I'm not sure who, who said it, but I liked it. Tithing is an act of faith that shows that I am committed to God and the work of the kingdom. Tithing releases joy, prosperity, and favor in my life. This, uh, this one by Jeffrey Holland. Pay your tithes and offerings out of honesty and integrity because they are God's rightful due. Paying tithing is not a token gift we're somehow charitably bestowing upon God. Paying tithing is discharging a debt. I really like that. Remember when, when Joshua took the Israelites into the promised land and they took Jericho and Achan withheld the, the, the spoils? You know, because God said, God told uh, Joshua that he had to take 10%, 10 of the spoils and offer them up to the temple for God. And he thought, ah, you know, no way. And what happened? He and his family perished because of it. Don't mess with God. And, I, and I'm saying that, like I said, I shouldn't feel like I need to keep saying that. I'm not interested in your money. Your money doesn't interest, but it does interest me how it affects you, whether you give your tithe. And bear in mind, it says, don't, you don't give the tithe, you pay the tithe. You give offerings. I remember somebody once said to me, said, oh, I don't tithe, but I do give um, and I said, until you tithe, you, don't, you can't give. You have to pay your tithe first. Then anything on top of the tithe is your giving. So we're, we're actually doing something that God commands. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. When he commands us to be this way, that's how we are to be. I don't think that it is really difficult to understand. The big question is, Will we do it? Will we do it? Will we be obedient children? You know, he promised eternal life to those who are obedient to him. If we resent the things of God, if we do not follow his instructions, we're simply not going to finish the race. And as hard as that may sound, and as critical as it might sound, it's truth. It's truth. It's the word of God. And if nothing else, if you get nothing else out of this message, except I need to read my Bible a bit more, then something's happened. Study the scriptures to show yourself approved before man and God. P uh, Timothy says in his second epistle, he, says, he talks about you've, ob you've obeyed the scriptures uh, from childhood, which are able to make you wise towards salvation. All these things that we're talking about in the things that accompany salvation are things that are, should be applied to our lives. So we, we either take it seriously and we say, I need to be very careful here because you're talking about your eternal destiny. You're talking about where you spend eternity. There's only two destinations. You go to one or the other. And I don't think it's unreasonable for me to encourage you, examine yourself to see whether you're actually obeying the scriptures. Jesus didn't hang on that tree so that we could just continue in, in our old carnal nature. We are to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We are to be like him. And I, I do believe the time is coming when there'll be sufficient of the church wakes up to realize that this is not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if we're going to live in this relationship with him, he says, why do you call me Lord and don't do the things I say? I think we need to take it very, very seriously. Nobody, and, and I'll tell you why I'm so firm on the, I'm not legalistic. 
I think you know that. I'm not legalistic at all. It's your choice. Your choice. That's what God says. He says, it's your choice. So if God says that, that's what I say. I don't try to convince you to think the way I think. I will direct you to the scriptures because it's the scriptures that bring faith. But if, if I, I, I remember when I was praying once and talking to God and he showed me, I'm not going to tell you exactly what he said and what he showed me, but it was a bit like the Ezekiel, you know, with the watchman. He said, if you're the watchman and you see trouble coming and you don't warn them, it's on your head. But he says, if you see trouble coming and you warn them and they ignore you, it's on their head. And he, he was showing this to me. If I don't preach his word, if I don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and people don't go to heaven because of that, I'm responsible. A, a teacher is subject to double judgment. When I saw that in Hebrews, it wake, woke me up, really. I thought, I've got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to tickle your ears. You know that. I'm not going to tickle your ears. That's why we have a small church. People want to have their ears tickled and be told, oh, God's just going to bless you and God wants it. I do not want to stand before God on the day of judgment and hear him say, why didn't you warn them? Because I'm accountable. Now that I've dispatched that, it's on your head. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to do something about it? Or are you going to take Jesus a little bit more seriously? Or are we just going to plod on? Are we going to be diligent or are we going to be careless? The choice is ours. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that comes to bring that truth to us. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us here this morning, for anybody that may watch or hear the message, Lord. I pray that you would touch our hearts, that you would convict us of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Lord, that you would help us in our quest to become like you. Lord, we know that if we desire it, you will do it in us and through us, through your Holy Spirit. So help us to this end, Lord, we pray. Help us to be like you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Seen from his mouth the bright and sharp two-edged sword, his name revealed to all the word of God.